Hey everybody, this is John Ziegler and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. Both of these women now believe they were duped and that he was never abused by Jerry Sandusky. So I'm talking 12 people really close are all willing to go on the record for no self-interest because this is a guy who is a media darling, Aaron Fisher, and who's rich. He's the richest guy in the neighborhood now. Yeah, he's been enriched. Right. So there's no reason to go up against him. None. And, and by the way, interestingly, in the reverse, I've gotten nobody. I've gotten nobody to come forward, and I'm very, I'm very accessible. I'm very well known. Yeah. In, Aaron, in Aaron Fisher's neighborhood or, or his community of Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, I would say more people know me there than just about anywhere in the country because this story has been of intense interest there, and what I've done has been of intense interest. You would think one person Somebody. would come up to me and go, you know, even a Facebook message, hey, Ziegler, yeah. knock, knock it off. I know Aaron. He's not lying. You got this one wrong. You got it wrong. Yeah. Not one. Mm. Not one. In fact, the only person who has even remotely done that is his mother, but she's done it in a way – that is rather fascinating because put yourself in the position of being the mother, right? You're the mother of a, of a kid who um, your story is under your watch, you send him to a serial pedophile for three years to babysit him, okay? Now, any human being would have some semblance of guilt there, even if you were a sociopath, probably you'd have some sense of guilt there. But if someone who had studied the case came to you and said, hey, mom, guess what? You really didn't fuck this up. Your, your son wasn't abused. Now, you might not believe it, but you'd want to hear about it, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. you'd at least, well, wait a minute. You, you, you would be like, This is please. the person who can vindicate me. Right, yeah. yes. You, you, you would want to hear my story. You would want to at least hear me out. No. Aaron Fisher's mom immediately, immediately hates my fucking guts. And she's cursing me out, not substantively, but like in drunken Facebook you know, <laughs> rants right. that make no sense. To me, this is far more consistent with what we know of her, which is that her first statement to the neighbor after Aaron makes any mention, the most benign mention possible, of Jerry having done potentially something that made him feel uncomfortable. Her first statement, first one out of the box to the neighbor was... I'm going to own that motherfucker's house. That's what, he, that's what she said to the neighbor. This, you're it, so right. This whole case is upside down because all the evidence is pointing the other direction. Exactly. All the motive is going the other direction. Exactly. I mean, if you follow the money, where's the money going? And, all, and again, child abuse is obviously bad and terrible. We're not talking right. about that. We're just talking about if you are sitting there as the accused in a cell. You know, how on earth do you even have a fair shot? There's no way. Everybody's in, against you. In this case, you have no shot because it's all about what people are saying. Right. And, and this is, let me take this for a second because I want, we'll go back to the, the, the facts of this case in particular. But let me take this out of this case and, and broaden it a little bit. Because one of the things that has really, uh, of many, that has upset me about this case and driven me. Because, I mean, obviously something has to be driving me. I'm not insane. Because I know I'm not going to get any, any personal benefit out of this. This has cost me money. This has cost me my reputation. It's cost me jobs. I mean, it's, it's An given... An ungodly amount of time. A ridiculous amount of time. You know a lot about this case. Great. I've got gray hair because of it. I've, I've, I've gained weight because of it. My nerves are shot. So Your cat loves you, though. Look at that. Well, yeah. Well, our cat is... He's, I don't know what is up with him. He's about the only one that still loves me because he, know, he knows nothing about the Sandusky case. Although, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the cat. <laughs> this, is, this will show you my, I think, I, inadvertently, this will show you my credibility on this case. When the story first broke, this cat right here that, that is, obviously we can't see, but you'll, you'll have to believe is here. He, he has a buddy. We have two cats. He um, effectively rapes the other cat constantly. I mean, they're both castrated, but yeah. I mean, he's pretending to rape the other cat. Yeah. So when this story broke, we started referring to this cat as Sandusky. Wow. Because I just presumed Sandusky was guilty, right? So, yeah. I mean, I hope that gives you some sense that I've gone 180 degrees on sure. this thing. So anyway, so, so broadening the picture here, one of the things that ought to terrify everybody about this case is not just what you said about what the hell would you do in your, if you were in his spot because you're screwed. The news media now 
ha decides truth not based on what is true. It's on what is popular. It's on what is good for them. It's, it's based, and, and so a story like mine, which has always baffled me, I would be thinking in a rational world, people would love to hear my story because guess what? I got good news. Nobody was sexually abused in this case. Right. But I'm making, I'm telling a story that nobody wants to hear because at best it makes people feel awful for having jumped to a false conclusion and railroaded a bunch of people. So when I put out a, and by the way, we live in a world now where everything's about how many things get retweeted on Twitter, liked on Facebook. That's what the media cares about. Who the fuck is going to retweet something that I put out there that says Jerry Sandusky is innocent or like it on Facebook? Because now there's a permanent record right. of you backing the most unpopular person in the country. So you can't get traction. And no media outlet is going to give you the time of day because, and I've had media people tell me this. I've had, there, are, there are absolutely major media people who know I'm right, who know this case is a fraud, but there's no incentive for them to do anything about it because the only logical scenario, the more likely scenario is they're going to lose their, their gig, their job, or at the very least, they're going to lose Twitter followers or Facebook followers because no one will wait to, to actually read or watch the whole story. They'll just see, you're supporting Jerry Sandusky or even Joe Paterno. And, and, yeah. and, you're, and there's no risk reward there. And to me, this, is, this is, goes way beyond this case because I see it in all sorts of cases. What, what wins the media now is not what's true, it's what's popular. And unpopular truths have no shot, none in this world we're living in. They've all, unpopular truths have always had a tough time, but in a Twitter, Facebook, YouTube world where you can see, and it, it absolutely impacts uh, how, how you perceive something, you can see how many people are liking or retweeting or viewing it, you got no chance when you're on the unpopular side. And that's, that is really dangerous, really dangerous, because popularity <laughs> should not dictate truth. In fact, and more often than not, and I think we've seen it in this election a lot, people people love to buy into popular untruths. I mean, a popular untruth will fly on the internet way more than an unpopular truth. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if it's one that allows your own personal sanctimony. Exactly. You know, when you can say, God damn those child molesters and Seriously, God damn those child molesters. Exactly. But when You're a good you person. have something that allows you to holler that from the mountaintop, uh, you're right. Makes you feel you good about yourself. Yeah. Let's Man. say you happen to have the only piece of information that, for instance, Hitler was a great cook. <laughs> you're not going to publicize that. And I want to say this because for our listeners. Al tacos. They really were. <laughs> they were is, is that. We are, uh, now, John, you and I don't know each other very well, but uh, I'm in your house. It's a lovely home. I know you to be a, a terrific family man and a very hospitable guy. We walked in here, and the first thing you said was, hey, are you guys hungry? I'll get you a pizza. And, you know, everything that we know of you in the reputation that you have that still exists. <laughs> There's not much of that. <laughs> that you, you're a guy who fights hard for your own principles and that you are all about justice and fairness and yeah. all of those things. And most people in the public don't think I'm an asshole. Well, that's I mean, true. No, no, absolutely. It's, <laughs> it's true that they think that or that I am. It could yes. be both. No, at times I am an asshole, but not on this. Uh, you know, I mean, you have to, in order to fight this battle, you better be an asshole. Yeah. You got, you got to have the skin. Cause you got, you have no chance. Otherwise, I mean, I, I'm not going to win this. Yeah, but, uh, it's, but a, it's important, though. And it, this is the thing I want to say to you about this. I know you sacrificed a lot. And let's say that you are absolutely wrong, mm -hmm. but you're applying pressure to a system that is absolutely capable and has done a lot of railroading of people. I mean, try being a black dude anywhere mm -hmm. near a crime scene with no evidence. DNA proves you're innocent. You go sit on death row for a long time and hopefully you get a chance. We've proven that we can do that over and over again. So 
I, I get that, and people. I appreciate that, but I'm convinced that that's not what's happening here. I, I, I don't think I'm just testing this case. And, and by the way, there will be some some validity to that effort to yeah. just to just test the case because no one did. I mean, this was even even if Jerry was well, guilty, why would they? even if Jerry was guilty, this yeah. was still a Salem witch trial. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just as an aside, because I don't think we even got into this last time, and there's so many different things, and I know we want to get to what happened with the, the victim number two hearing last week yeah. but this is this is the most underrated uh uh victim story of this whole case and it absolutely killed penn state it's the victim number so-called victim number eight janitor episode try this one on for size guys this is a story that destroyed penn state because the story was that a janitor had witnessed jerry sandusky molesting a boy in late 2000 now what and jerry got convicted on five major counts in this episode Prepare to have your your uh, chill factor uh, go to eleven on this. Here, here's what the that particular count did not have. It did not have a victim. It did not have a date. It did not have a contemporaneous report. And it did not have a direct witness. The only witness was a hearsay witness that was only allowed in because of a, some exception to the hearsay rule, which I don't agree with, when even the judge himself on appeal said he might have screwed up. A hearsay witness says that some other guy told him that this happened. He didn't witness himself, but some other janitor told him it did. Except there's an even bigger problem. There was an interview that the prosecution did with the actual direct witness. And in that interview, three times... The witness says unequivocally, it wasn't Jerry Sandusky I saw. Are you kidding me? And that interview is not presented at trial. Well, I be wouldn't be. Because, <laughs> because here's what happens. The prosecution, after they interviewed the direct witness, they determine this is, this is their mindset. This is the prosecution mindset. They're so sure they're right that when he says it wasn't Jerry Sandusky, they determine that he has dementia. And they tell the defense, they tell the defense, well, guess we interviewed him, but he has dementia. So the interview really isn't uh, of any value. Wow. Uh, and stupidly, Joe's, uh, Joe Mandola, the defense attorney, says, okay, fine. And remember, he's completely overwhelmed. He's in the middle of a hurricane. He has no help. The, his his co-counsel's in jail right now for, uh, for, for fraud. Uh, I mean, so, so Jerry's defense team, you know, they've got, they've got, they're, they're on a ship that is sinking with leaks everywhere. And they go, okay, whatever, fine. You told us about that interview. We don't even have time to look into it. But that was a, that was one of the most important elements of this case. And it couldn't have, you literally couldn't have, make up a story that's more bullshit. So this is uh, victim number eight. Eight. There was no victim. There was no witness. There was no report. There, there was no date. And by the way, the date thing is so important to this. There to my knowledge, there is only one specific date in the whole case, maybe two by the same kid, number four. But there's only one specific date in the whole case where someone testifies on this date in this place, this is what happens. One. Every single other one, Jerry has no way to defend himself because you can't even say my schedule says I was out of town. Yeah. If you don't give a date, right? If you yeah. don't give you don't give a date, how do you defend that? Oh yeah, ten years ago, in a month of November in two thousand, something happened. We don't have the victim. We don't have a witness. Go ahead and defend yourself on that one. Yeah, I, 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 I DK. I got raped a bunch of times. I don't know. Maybe it was in seventy six. Maybe it was ninety two. I don't. Know. But I got raped a whole bunch. Exactly. Yeah. And by the way, uh, victim number five. Victim number five at trial changes the year. Forget about the date. There's no date. He changes the year by three or four years. He goes, he goes from being an eight-year-old to a 12-year-old. And the reason that I, I believe that that happened was because the prosecution wanted an event in a Penn State shower after McQueary to show that Sandusky didn't stop after that point. And so suddenly victim five 
goes, and, and interestingly, if you look at his testimony, he still doesn't know what fuck year it is. He, they're, they're saying, was it 2001? Was it 2002? He says, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. In fact, though, I think one point he says, yeah, it was 2002. Later in the testimony, he says, yeah, it was 2001. And to be clear, his original testimony was 1998. And you can't, you can't do, how, how do you defend yourself against that? It, it's impossible. Forget about a date. You don't even have a year. So, well, and the the thing that I want to go back to for our listeners who didn't listen to the previous episodes, uh, Pete, when's the last time the Cubs won the World Series before this year? Oh, uh, 1908. 1908. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Pete, I know to be a baseball fan, not specifically a Cubs fan, although right. somewhat. Yeah. Right? You like the Cubs. Uh, but. You guys, sports fans and sports and McQueary in particular. You sports made you made that was a great point you made. Sports players do not fucking forget the year. Right. Well, McQueary in particular, you made that, and I never thought about that, but you made a fantastic point in our first series where you say, "Wait a minute, how does McQueary misremember the year in which this amazing thing, horrendous, horrific, horrible thing he witnessed happens?" When, as a football coach, especially a college football coach, because yep. college football happens within a year. Now, granted, now they go into the playoffs, you know, the beginning of January. Sure. But, but in your mind, everything is what happened that year. You know who was on that team. You know what players were co- you were coaching that year, and you never forget it, uh, especially whether it happened before or after 9/11. So I agree with that uh, in 100%. And by the way, the one other thing about the date, which is really important about McQueen, because this will get us back to victim two and what happened this past week. But the, the date thing is so important, not just because it, it diminishes his credibility that he forgets the date. Had we known five years ago today, when this story was, you know, a firestorm, had we known the correct date, it would have changed a bunch of things, including we would have known that two days before the, the episode he witnesses, McQu- there was an open job. There was a job that opens at Penn State. Kenny Jackson leaves Penn State to be the wide receivers coach. He was the wide receivers coach at Penn State. He goes to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, why is that so important? It's incredibly important for a couple of reasons. So there's an open job when this thing happens. And Mike's dad tells him to go see Joe Paterno on that Saturday. That's not a coincidence. Mike's dad realizes there's a job that's open that Mike is qualified for and wants. So this is a great opportunity to get FaceTime with Joe Paterno and show him what a great Boy Scout you are. Yep. Well, not only that, it also disproves the entire fucking cover-up bullshit. Because if there had been a cover-up and McQuarrie comes to Paterno on that Saturday and says, Coach, man, whew, wow. I saw Jerry Sandusky raping a boy in a shower last night. And Paterno goes, okay, look, we've known about this problem for a while. Let's just keep this between you and me. By the way, you've been doing such a great job. I don't know if you heard, but Kenny Jackson just left to go to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Congratulations. We probably ought to promote you. Uh, yeah, keep your mouth shut. Congratulations. You are our new wide receivers coach. That doesn't happen. Right. By You're the way, a new wide receivers coach, as long as you keep quiet. About right. Well, doesn't you know? You don't even have to say that. It's yeah. just a wink, wink, nod, nod. Just hey, for the for our hey, listeners, hey, that's you know, how the understanding yeah, yeah. goes. So if it's a cover up, right? And by the way, so not only does that not happen, guess what happens? Three years later, the job opens again, and that time McQuarrie gets the job. So it's not as if a situation where he wasn't qualified for it or he didn't want it. That's the job he wanted. Yeah. And, and so, eventually got. And eventually got three years. And everybody years, knew he would do the job. At three years later. So for so you're going to leave the only witness in this amazing cover-up hanging without a job. By the way, it's not just a promotion. He's a graduate. It's a job. He has no job currently. Now he's, three years later, you give him a paycheck. Right. But it's important for people to understand, a graduate assistant is nothing. You are you are nobody. You are the lowest on the totem pole. You might be getting paid a few thousand dollars. I don't even think you get benefits. You you are desperate for a job. And McQueary doesn't get one and yet he stays he keeps his mouth shut. He never uses this as hey coach, you know, I'm I'm thinking about uh going yeah, to hook tell brother up yeah. before I go I tell mean, somebody. I mean, seriously? And by the way, his dad, from everything I know about his dad, his dad would have used this yeah. if if he thought it was a gun to uh, Joe Paterno's head. 
And that's why I'm convinced. And by the way, Jay Paterno, Joe Paterno's son, who was coaching with Mike McQuarrie and knows Mike McQuarrie very well, knows Jerry Zandusky very well, and I believe believes that Jerry Zandusky is innocent but can't say it for obvious political reasons, that it was Jay Paterno who very vehemently believes that it was the Kenny Jackson job that was the real motivator for why McQuarrie goes to Paterno that next day. Uh, and interestingly, this doesn't prove it, but it, I'm a big, I'm a big into psychology. So Mike, Mike testifies that, um, that when he calls Joe Paterno, uh, the first thing Paterno says to him, if this is about a job, don't bother coming over. I don't have one for you. Now that, first of all, it's an odd thing to remember 10 years later, but okay. You're going to remember that specificity. But when I, I happened to mention that testimony in the, sitting at the very kitchen table where McQuarrie and Paterno had their infamous 10 minute conversation about uh, Sandusky in this Paterno home, bunch of people around, including Sue Paterno, who was there that day of the McQuarrie Paterno conversation. And I happened to mention this testimony that at the time I didn't think was very important about Joe telling Mike, if this is about a job, don't bother coming over. I don't have one for you. And Sue Paterno standing 10 feet away, getting peachy Paterno ice cream from the freezer, turns around and says, that didn't happen. And I'm like, whoa. Yeah. Whoa. I mean, this is a woman who's been married, you know, for whatever, 50 some years. I mean, she knows her husband. She was there. I didn't even think it was significant at the time. That stuck in my brain. Like, okay, she's not that upset about that for, for no reason. There's a reason she believes that that's a lie. And why would Mike lie about that? Well, if you think about it subconsciously, Mike's making shit up in order to justify what was really going on, at least in his subconscious, because subconsciously it was about a job. And he's cre- And by the way, this is not the only time that Mike has seemingly put words in a dead man's mouth. It's very easy to put words in a dead man's mouth. Uh, and Mike has done that consistently. And in fact, he did it at that civil trial that he won $7.3 million for, which is more than twice the amount of money that the alleged victim in that victim two case got, which is just mind blowing. Mike had no case against Penn State, even if, by the way, he had seen a rape. He had no case. Mike was was let go for purely football reasons. And the idea that Mike McQuarrie ends up getting at least $7.3 million, probably more for at best. And I, don't bl- I believe he, he was manipulated and ended up causing the whole program to fall for no reason. But at best, Mike McQuarrie is a coward who did a very, 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 very poor job of articulating what he saw, and he got paid $7.3 million because of that. And by the way, he might get more soon, depending on what the judge does in the case. That's bizarre, but, it's a, but, it, but you know what else? Here, here's why that happened. The media coverage of five years has so polluted any jury pool in Pennsylvania, there is no chance for justice, a- including for the administrators. The administrators, it's incredibly important to point out, five years later, has still never seen a trial. Five For five years, these guys have been under indictment. These are these were people with incredibly impeccable reputations. There's not a shred of evidence they did anything. I've, I've gotten to know the president of Penn State at the time, Graham Spanier, who got fired over this whole thing, exceedingly well. He's probably the best person I've met in this whole thing. In fact, Speaking of all, everything being upside down, I would say all the of all the people that I have met that I've considered to be good people in this, they're all the ones that have been vilified by the news media. Franco Harris, NFL legend, is, is now probably one of my best friends because you know we've been in this foxhole together now for four years. He's been vilified by the news media. Graham Spanier is a tremendous guy, an abuse victim himself as a kid. Not a chance in the world he would have engaged in some sort of bizarre, nonsensical cover up cover, the, I mean, yeah. for, which by the way no one benefited from there was no benefit to protecting jerry sandusky as a retired assistant coach there's no benefit to that it's absurd so anyway the the, the mcquery civil trial is it was a joke but it was also an indication of how and why this whole thing happened because the news media has so polluted everybody's brains and that leads us to this hearing that happened last week which to me uh you know we, we talked about earlier about how the first guy who should have talked in this story was Alan Myers, and now he's the last guy who will talk. And uh, it was a really amazing event to witness because so after five years, Jerry is con- has been convinced, and I'm I'm pretty sure that the only thing keeping Jerry alive, like mentally in prison, 
assuming I'm right and that he's totally innocent, uh, which I'm very confident that I am. I think the only thing keeping him going was the idea that Alan Myers might one day testify and tell the truth because Alan Myers, the kid in the McQuarrie episode, just to review people's recollections, here are the things that happened with Jerry and Alan after the McQuarrie episode. And this is why any logical person. Hold on. So, so this is the alleged McQuarrie the alleged, episode, right? So this is, this is the relationship afterwards. So the, the event happens in February of 2001 couple years later, uh, Alan's on his varsity high school football team. He has no dad. And part of this perfect storm is that, you know, Jerry's dealing with all these kids from broken homes. So, so when the investigators go to this pool of second mile kids, <laughs> they're going to find a lot of really bad stuff and yeah. a lot of uh, kids and, and men who are now in really bad situations who are really, you're going to find a few who are more than willing to go, yeah, this sounds uh, promising. Uh, and by the way, also will believe that they deserve it because they probably have been abused, whether sexually or physically at some point in their lives. So even though it wasn't Jerry, fuck it, I don't care. I mean, I'm going to get my money out He's of this. He's already going to jail. He's already going to jail, whatever, not, not on me. Right. Anyway, long story short, uh, who does Alan Myers have stand in at, at a senior high school football game as his dad? Jerry Sandusky. This is three and a half years after the... McQuarrie episode. The next spring, uh, Alan asks uh, Jerry Sandusky to speak at his uh, high school graduation from West Branch High School in Pennsylvania as the commencement address speaker. Sure enough, Jerry Sandusky accepts it, does on, for Alan, speaks as the commencement address speaker at his high school. Alan uh, goes to Penn State for a semester during the summer. He stays, lives with for three months, the Sanduskies, Jerry and Dottie Sandusky. He then goes into the Marines. Now, the Marine element thing is really important, I think. I mean, there's going to the military and then there's being a Marine. Uh, and not only do you take an oath, but you know, you, you cannot be a Marine unless you're at least somewhat of a tough guy. Uh, there are certain elements to your psychology and your physicality that, that to me uh, make it very, very difficult to believe that you would engage in a long-term relationship with a guy who was sexually abusing you and never tell anybody about it. That just seems preposterous. Also so, not come back and kick his ass. Well, exactly. And so, so, and then, uh, by the way, during this time period, and I've shown you guys the photograph of this, Alan Myers helps Jerry Sandusky coach 12 year old boys at his football camp. There's a photograph in the local paper of Alan and Jerry standing together in their team photo as Alan helps coach these kids. Let's speak to yeah. the Marines in our, in our audience. Listen up Marines. Let's say that some preposterous, some absolutely heinous crime was committed upon you as a child. And now you are a capable Marine, right? Are you going to help that person who committed that heinous act? Right farm right exactly you're helping him groom 12 year old boys yeah you're helping him groom new victims you're not going to come back to town and, and help them right out. and then and then just to finish this there's a couple other things you wouldn't do so jerry's mother dies alan is a marine in north carolina alan drives at least 10 and a half hours each way to go to the funeral of jerry's mother then alan as a sergeant in the marine corps and i've shown you guys this photograph he gets married who does he invite to his wedding? As a 23-year-old sergeant of the Marine Corps, he invites Jerry and Dottie Sandusky to his wedding. Jerry and Alan take a photo together alone. That photo Jerry uses in the resignation letter in 2010 from the Second Mile, in which, by the way, in his entire Second Mile career, Jerry Sandusky mentions one Second Mile charity kid. You guessed it. It's Alan Myers. This was a father-son relationship. As a matter of fact, one of the few things that Alan Myers testified to truthfully the other day was, yes, he acknowledged that Jerry and he had a father-son relationship, that, he, that Jerry was a father figure to him. And so on November 9th, when this whole story breaks, five years ago this week as we're talking, Alan comes into Joe Amendola, Jerry's defense attorney's office, and gives a blockbuster statement. I'll give you the statement when we, when we leave here. Blockbuster to, to Jerry's investigator, FBI trained former police officer, 
says, I'm the kid in the shower. This is ridiculous. Mike McCreary is not telling the truth. I was never abused. Jerry's is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. By the way, I've been interviewed previously by police. I thought they were trying to get me to lie. I ended the interview by saying, I will never say anything bad about Jerry Sandusky. I mean, you literally couldn't have a stronger witness on your side. By the way, he also knows two things that only the McQuarrie victim could possibly know. He know he which were not reported at the time. He knows about the door slam that we referenced earlier, and he also knows that Jerry had called him saying, "Hey, you know what? Penn State might come and talk to you about this. Are you okay with that?" Which is incredibly important because there's no way for any other Jerry Sandusky kid to have had that experience because this is the only episode on record where anything like that happened, where, in fact, Penn State, it's on record, uh, Jerry Sandusky told Tim Curley, the athletic director at Penn State, hey, why don't you, do you want the kid's name? Contact him. You know, we'll fix this. It's all misunderstanding. Penn State so believes, Tim Curley so believes Jerry Sandusky, they don't even bother to call the kid. Because I, I don't think McQuarrie told them anything. I think he told them, hey, I saw him with a shower. Jerry says, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Do you want to talk to the kid? Jerry informs the kid. But, these, but for purposes of identification, this is really important because there's no possible way on November 9, 2011, anybody but the McQuarrie kid knows those two things. Not to mention the fact that nobody else has ever come forward saying they're the McQuarrie kid, which is impossible in this case. So unfortunately that night, Joe Paterno gets fired. The whole world changes. The next morning, everybody knows that $100 million is on the table. Allen gets an attorney by the name of Andrew Shubin, who had previously represented him in a a DUI and for whom his mother had once worked. By the way, his mother came in to Amendola's office with uh, with Allen Myers. And... um, (laughs) And, and, you know, interestingly, I had a confrontation with his mother uh, the other day, uh, I, and I, I asked her, among other things, uh, after his testimony, whether or not she was proud of the son that uh, she had helped raise, uh, that he would do something like this to Jerry Sandusky after everything that had been done to him. And I also uh, advised her that she might be um, want to be praying that there is no hell. Uh, and that uh, she should enjoy the money. She said nothing to me, and her, her uh, not her husband, her, her uh, son, her other son, uh, physically blocked my way uh, to having a conversation with her. She was clearly knew who I was uh, and wanted nothing to do with me, but didn't say anything to me either. By the way, it's important to point out that I have contacted Alan Myers during this process numerous times via an email, which I know to be true, I, uh, and I have been very kind to him. I have said to him, uh, look, if I somehow got this wrong, all you got to do is email me back a phrase. You know, you got it wrong, whatever. You know, dude, leave me alone, anything. Uh, here's my phone number. I've given him my, my cell phone number, my home phone number, my address, my email address. I've done YouTube videos specifically for him. By the way, you can go to YouTube. I've made one of them public so people can know this. It's the it's the most gentle video you could possibly imagine. Hey, I I'm trying to understand your pers- your spe- perspective here. Just help me out. I, I want the truth. And he never has in any way, shape, or form responded. Uh, I would have I shut down everything in this case if Alan had just said, you know what, uh, I'm abused. You got it wrong. Yeah, you got it wrong. Never happened. So anyway, as we've already mentioned, Alan does not testify at trial. There's an allegation that Alan was being hidden by his attorney during the, the trial. Hidden in the cabin. Interestingly, when he was asked about that uh, a few days ago, <laughs> it's amazing how Alan doesn't remember anything about hardly any of this case except the parts that occurred after the money was on the table. Then he, he remembers a lot. Uh, he, his story is that he doesn't remember where he was uh, during the Jerry Sandusky trial. Now, this is a guy who was, by his own admission, a father figure. It's the biggest trial in the modern history of Pennsylvania. He's a huge part of it. And he, and doesn't, he remember doesn't remember where, where he, he was. was. He says his, he actually says, I was somewhere in central Pennsylvania. I don't know where. I don't remember. That's his, that's his response. I don't remember where I was. By the way, speaking of his bad memory, which is, of course, you agree that's absurd, right? There's no way he doesn't remember where he was. That kind of event in your life, that kind of event happening so close to somebody who you've had a father-son relationship Even with? if they, especially, by the way, if they abused you. Especially if they abused you. You yeah. want that motherfucker to burn. That's right. right. You know exactly what happened. Right. You remember all the details. Right. Yeah. He doesn't know where he was. But uh, he also, when given the photo, he was given the photos I've referred to you. In fact, I, I was the one that gave him. I think I was the one that gave him to the uh, attorney for Jerry Zendusky. He was shown the photos I've referenced. 
In fact, the wedding photo of him and Jerry together, Alan in his Marine uniform on his wedding day, he was asked, when did this photo, when was this photo taken? He says, I don't know, I don't remember. His wedding! He, <laughs> his wedding, he doesn't remember. That's, that's, it, that's someone who's coached. Yeah, yeah. he is yeah, absolutely. That's obvious. That, I mean, maybe not, maybe Jerry Sandusky is guilty, but that's someone who's coached. Well, it's funny you say that because at this hearing, uh, and, and this is something I've not talked about really publicly, uh, which people We're find wide exclusive on the right, Pick It Down well, show. No, well, this is a pretty good, this is a hell of an element to the story. In attendance at that hearing, you said he was coached, right? In attendance at that hearing was a purposely fake accuser that has several years ago went to the very same attorney that we're referencing here that and um, and who was absolutely coached. And I have you guys, have, I've played audio for you mm -hmm. uh, in which I show you how he was coached. And the first words out of that fake accuser's mouth in witnessing Alan Myers was, he has been coached. And this is a guy who was experienced it by the very same attorney. Uh, and so, so anyway, Alan, Alan's testimony was interesting on a number of levels. I was very concerned that Jerry's attorney was going to be too soft and not realize how critical this was. I had given him a 2,000 word report on how to handle Alan Myers. I, I, when I got to the courthouse, I heard through the media grapevine that Alan was attending the uh, proceedings with two victims advocates uh, who were going to speak on his behalf afterwards. And I thought, uh oh, this is going to really be bad. Interestingly, Alan has never on the record said that he was abused in the McQuarrie episode. Never. Which is why he only, and I say only in quotes, got $3 million from Penn State. Most other accusers got more. But because he didn't say he was abused in the McQuarrie episode, even though he was the kid there, yeah. they only gave him $3 million. But I knew he, if he's having victims advocates there in order to speak for him, this is bad news. So I alerted Jerry's attorney to this, and I could tell he was going to be way too conservative. I said, look, Al, uh, Al Lindsay's his name, you're, you're down 21 points with a minute left to go in the game. This, 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 there, is no, there is no sitting on the ball here. You, yeah, you got to start hugging you, Hail Marys you, you, you at this gotta, You got to destroy him. And, and he said, no, uh, look, well, you know, this is a technical process. We need, you know, I need to be very careful with him. And I'm like, oh, God. So sure enough, long story short, Allen's testimony was marked by a lot of anger, except none of it was directed at Jerry Sandusky. Wow. Uh, he was angry at Al Lindsay for raising his voice to him, which he did not do. He was really angry because an investigator who was working for me came to his house and was let in by his wife uh, and asked him about his original statement that nothing had ever happened here. And Alan, interestingly, his memory comes right back because he remembers exactly what he told the investigator who was, I guess, working for me. Uh, and I know this to be true because I have an audio tape of this altercation. Alan quotes himself exactly right, telling him to get the fuck out of his house. So he doesn't have any problem remembering that. And he's very angry about it. But again, that's not anger at Jerry Sandusky. That's an anger at someone trying to get him on the record as to what really happened here. And then he's also angry a couple of other times at things that had nothing at all to do with Jerry Sandusky. You would think if he was abused by Jerry Sandusky, the anger would be at Jerry. But I never saw any anger at Jerry Sandusky. And I also, there was never, unfortunately, he got to claim abuse by, by uttering one syllable, literally one syllable. He was asked the question, were you abused by Jerry Sandusky? He said, yes. That was it. That's it. Now, I'm sorry. You can say yes to anything. I mean, especially when money's on the line. There was no, unfortunately, there was no detail. We, to this day, we don't know. He never said that he was abused in the McQuarrie episode. The Commonwealth, when they had a chance to question him, interestingly, and I think not coincidentally, they don't ask him whether he was abused in the McQuarrie episode. They simply just reiterated, were you abused? And he says, yes. Uh, so to this, to this day, he's never been on the record in any way, shape, or form saying that he was abused in the McQuarrie episode. I know he wasn't. And interestingly... You would think, especially with the media propaganda in this case, that after this guy finally testifies and says, yes, I was abused by Jerry Sandusky with no details whatsoever, that people in the courtroom might be impacted by that. You might, you know, I guarantee there was not one person in that courtroom who even remotely came up to me and said, 
because everybody there knows who I am. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a couple hundred people, not one person. And granted, I guarantee you, at least half the people there would love for me to have been wrong and, and shove it up my backside. Uh, not one person even remotely came up to me and said, boy, you really blew this or, you know, wow, oh, Ziggler, well, how are you going to explain this? Not one. And every, and I would say the majority of people that were there were actually Sandusky supporters, which ought to say something. You realize how insane it is that there are, there are such a thing as Jerry Sandusky supporters right. that you're going to go publicly and support him. And you have to really, 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 really believe it. And of those people, Everyone was positive that Alan Myers had lied. Everybody, and I was I was more confident about my being right than than ever after what I saw. And but I was also more confident than ever that this case is lost. That the, the truth will never be widely known. Jerry will die in prison. Joe Paterno's reputation will never be restored. And that the administrators who are still facing trial, they're in a whole fuckload of trouble. Even though the most of the charges have been dropped, there's still a couple minor charges left. But you know, no charge is minor once you get in front of a judge and a jury that wants to beat the crap out of you. Yeah. And um, especially for something like this. Yeah. And I and I, you know, the, Graham Spanier, the former president of Penn State, actually called me uh, to find out what happened in the hearing because I don't put words in his mouth. But let's just say he was very, very interested in what Alan Myers had to say, because he's never believed that there was any uh, actual abuse in the shower. And uh, we both agreed at the end of that conversation that uh, they can never go in front of a jury because they have no protection. I mean, after what we saw in the Mike McQuarrie civil trial verdict, which was absurd, and now that Alan Myers is, is clearly not going to come forward and tell the truth, they are in big trouble if they ever go in front of a jury. And then just let me just say, want, tell one other story about what happened at the hearing because I, I realized that the media was going to ignore this and um, and most people who don't know anything about the case would find this irrelevant. But to me, this was the most, by far the most impactful moment. So Alan gets off the stand and Jerry and his body language is just completely defeated. I mean, he's deflated. This is a guy who he looked at as a son who I guarantee he's been thinking. Loved him all his life. Loved it. Yeah, I guarantee. And I've spoken to him extensively about Alan. I guarantee in those dark, dark, dark alone moments of basically in solitary and confinement in a maximum security prison in Pennsylvania, the one of the things keeping him going was Alan will tell the truth. Alan will tell the truth. Alan, we just got to get Alan to, on the stand. He'll tell the truth. Alan won't do this to me too. And this comes and, from you. I mean, a guy that's talked intimately for a long time with oh, yeah. Sandusky. And hours in prison. Right. Hours in prison and on the phone and letters. I mean, I got dozens and dozens of letters. I mean, I'm telling you, Jerry never thought it was possible Alan would do this. And here he is. I mean, he is as deflated as he could possibly be. They call him to the stand. They call him to the stand. And I, I don't know. Maybe you guys will find this interesting. I, I did. Other people I've told this to don't find it that interesting. But there had been a problem with the microphone on the witness stand. And so Jerry, um, Jerry gets up there and he's in his orange jumpsuit and he's very frail now. And, and, he, and he blows into the microphone. And he goes, <laughs> and the thing like explodes, pops makes this huge boom and the judge now this is the judge who was presided over the original trial and he's presided over the appeal i mean he knows more about this case than any judge possibly could the judge starts joking with jerry and laughing with him about the fact that this microphone thing happened now to me i'm sorry if he really believes that jerry zadusky is the worst pedophile in the history of the state of pennsylvania you're not joking nothing's around funny. with it yeah nothing's funny you're yeah. not joking around with this guy so i thought that was an interesting insight into the judge's mentality and there's been other things that judge has done which i think indicate that the judge realizes something's not right here but he just doesn't have the balls to do anything about it but more importantly so jerry gets up on the stand he gets asked one question did you ever sexually abuse alan myers and Jerry, who is not normally an emotional guy, immediately, he's like shaking, he's choked up. You can tell the tears are welling up in his eyes and he is angry, angrier than I've ever seen him. And he says, absolutely not. And then that was it. That was the last, the only question they asked him. He, and in my guess although I, I would hate for this to be the case I, I think there's a pretty good chance that those are the last words jerry sandusky ever says in public because uh, i'm not sure i mean i'm i'm convinced that this judge is not going to order a new trial and then after that the process 
gets backlogged again. I mean, he still has other appeals and go to the state Supreme Court in Pennsylvania, but he's 73 years old. He's being treated like shit in prison, and I don't know how much longer he's going to live. I mean, he seems to be in decent health, but certainly I mean, he's 73 and, yeah. go, and going through hell. So um, that was really, to me, I, I, in a weird, bizarre way, I mean, even though it's a horrendous injustice in my mind, it was almost a weird a weirdly appropriate way for this case to end with with the, the guy who was there actually very convincingly saying this didn't happen and uh, no one caring no one giving a shit i guarantee i i i've been going through all the media articles because i hate reading them now because they're all such bullshit but i doubt very seriously if it was even reported widely that he's that that, that even happened uh, instead you know we get victims advocates who know nothing about the case uh <laughs> being quoted as if they're experts uh, on it. And I get completely ignored. In fact, I did a press conference afterwards. <laughs> I did a press conference afterwards and I'm telling them about the fake accuser, which you would think would be big news. Yeah. I'm telling them about the fake accuser that's integral to understanding what really happened in this case. I'm not going on long because I know I don't have much time with these people. And I say, I say, Anybody have any questions? And by the way, before I open it to questions, let me just predict none of you are going to have any questions because there's not a question you can ask that I can't answer in a way that's going to make you guys feel like you blew this story. But go ahead. Any questions? Crickets. Crickets. I Silence. might pipe in some crickets. <laughs> Silence. I, I have to say this because, uh, and I may drop this in at the beginning of the show. Mm -hmm. You are a father. Yeah. Pete is a father. I am a father. And mm -hmm. that none of the three of us would ever dream of getting behind somebody who hurts kids. And that that is absolutely crucial to the rest of this content because for somebody to listen to all that we have said in support of what could be the most heinous injustice that has happened in... A long my time. knowledge and certainly it <laughs> didn't involve a direct death the sure. loudest absolutely and the loudest publicized and the most widely publicized injustice that has happened in in recent years uh we're talking about you know you say that there isn't a direct death but we're we're looking at potentially the possibility that a man who did not get a fair trial dying in prison oh and it will be a horrible death i mean it will be because he is he he gets it no has been yeah <laughs> yeah no it's true i mean but he it's going to be really bad for him i mean this is a guy who, and, and uh you know he he gets, he gets no human contact yeah i mean none and this is a guy who you know really kind of craved that throughout his whole life which is part of how he got involved in this whole thing he was he's the he was a kind of guy who if someone told you if, if an investigator told you he's a pedophile you might go okay that's a little weird but it's possible he's he's a little he's goofy. Kinda, yeah, he's he's goofy, goofy and handsy and isn't afraid of contact and he puts his hand on your knee uh you know when driving and that kind of stuff and so um I think that this existence for him is particularly difficult although and I don't know this but I'm judging this from the letters I've gotten from him I would like to think he's going to rationalize this by <laughs> weirdly by thinking, you know what, uh, they destroyed me and my life uh, ended up in the worst way possible. But, you know, all those kids that I tried to help, 32 of them ended up being millionaires because of their relationship with me. Yeah. And then maybe they got some some joy out of that. Uh, that's the way he thinks. I mean, wow. uh, I, 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 I'm sure he has some anger in that, but I think that that, that on his deathbed... Mm -hmm. I, that will I, allow him to rest. I, I, I'm hoping. I would like to know, in your estimation, and I know we're playing the speculation game here, but if this is an injustice that is eventually righted, <laughs> how? How does it happen? Well, I, I, no, long, I no longer see a path. I mean, I, I, now that Alan Myers has made it clear he's not going to help. Yeah. Uh, that was the last bit of That, to me, light. was the last, you know, it, it, you know Al, uh, Jerry's lawyer was very happy with what happened Friday. I think that's delusional. Jerry's wife Dottie was seemingly happy with it, and I don't—I I didn't want to douse her. Uh, What's what uh, was to be happy about? They see one of the many problems in this case is that 
that there's the the normal legal case and then there's this case. In a normal legal case, if you were able to prove that a key witness was withheld from the trial right. by the prosecution and then the prosecution told the jury that that person is unknown to anyone but God, that would be enough. Mm -hmm. That gets you a new trial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not in this case, though. Right. Not in this case, because there'll be fucking riots. So they're thinking, as they have been thinking incorrectly all along, this is a, that justice will prevail, the law matters. No, the law doesn't mean fuck in this case. Yeah. And you, we needed a bombshell. We needed Alan Myers to either look like a complete idiot. Or, or just to voluntarily blow the right, whole thing up. Right, right, which... It was Which very frustrating. It was very frustrating to be there because I know that if I had been asking the questions and I had been given enough latitude by the judge, it would have turned out very differently. So uh, if you're the listener sitting in this jail cell, again, you know, the reasonable man right. kind of thing, you've got someone who went up as a false uh, victim and was told, like was coached. Is that right? Is that my saying? Yeah. That? Okay. I mean, I'm so, I, I just, right. I played you guys the audio. Of, so yeah. Um, so we, so we know that victims are being coached. We know mm. that the police will purposely try to twist things to get mm. things out of victims. Yep. We have a, per, a, a, a victim only known to God mm. and one who doesn't it, exist. It doesn't Complete exist. hearsay. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, this is that alone ought to put the fear of God into anybody sitting on the other side of this show going, it should. man, you know, that. There has to bring doubt into anybody <sighs> who's reasonable to say, what the hell has gone on here? I, I agree, but I, I, you know, if this was reasonable doubt is important, but I'm not doing this just for reason. I wouldn't devote my entire freaking well, yeah, life this, yeah, just for reasonable doubt. Is, I'm positive. He's innocent. I'm positive of it. But, so, it's, so what do we do? It's like, not even close. In, in effect, you're in a cell too. I mean, you, 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 right. I am in a cell. This and it's fair to say like, this is a, an obsession, a passion. Like it could, mm. when do you let this go and move on? I right about now. <laughs> you, I, I can absolutely tell that there is some resignation now in, you yeah. know, in your, demeanor and you, the way that you talk about it. No, I, I, I'm thinking about this case as history now as opposed yeah. to a, a current living thing. Yeah. Now, that could... No, look. Uh, if as I, as I refer to it, if the weather somehow changes in this case, right. I'm more than willing to get back in the game. But I, I'll give you an example. I mean, and that, this kind of thing happens all the time with me, which is why I'm positive I'm right. Just the other day, someone, anonymous person, contacts me on Facebook. Hey, you know this guy named uh, uh, Josh, and he loses the last name. I said, yeah, that name sounds familiar. He says, yeah, he, he's one of the Sandusky accusers who got millions from Penn State. I said, yeah, okay, what about him? Well, he got $5 million. I said, okay, I didn't know that, but that's interesting. He says, yeah, he's told me and his family members it never happened, that he just did it, that, just did it for the money. Jerry never touched him. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Will, will you talk to me? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid of what he'll do if I say something. Uh, the family members won't come forward. I mean, and by the, if this was one off, I'd go, well, that could be just a nut job. Yeah. I'm getting this all the time. I mean, if, if, the, if, if, the, and not just for one of these guys, I'm getting this constantly. I mean, I'm, I'm a smart enough guy to know if, if I was going down the wrong path, I would not be getting that kind of stuff. N none of that. I would not have 12 people on the record saying Aaron Fisher is lying. It's, and by the way, if Aaron Fisher is lying, if Aaron Fisher is lying, the whole case is shit because he's the only accuser for two years. He's the one they used to manipulate McQuarrie. So you, you can't start all this with shit and come up with anything else but shit. He's the tiny snowball at the top of the Right, hill. exactly. Yeah. It's all shit. The 71 and the 76 stories that got so much publicity about Joe Paterno allegedly being told in these settlements, complete bullshit. I mean, just, they don't even pass the laugh test, and yet the news media jumped on them as if they were, you know, gospel uh, from on high. They gotta feed so, the machine. So... Anyway, it's it's all very frustrating. It's all uh, I'm resigned to the fact that it's going to happen uh, in the worst way possible. That nothing good will ever occur from this. I don't give up easily, as anyone who knows me knows. 
So psychologically, I've given up, and I think that's healthy for my life and try to move on. I mean, it's going to be very difficult because of something called Google. You know, this will carry with me for the rest of my life, unfortunately. My daughters will probably, I have one daughter and one on the way. They'll both, I'm sure, be <laughs> regretting my involvement in this case for the rest of their lives. But I, I can also rest easy knowing I did everything I could and I know I was right. So you know, at the end of the day, you know, what can you do? So, That's yeah. what you can do. Yeah, you can do that. You can understand that, that you saw what you uh, absolutely perceived to be an injustice and you did everything you could. And, you and I it, failed. You put it, <laughs> no, you didn't fail. You put, it on, you put it on the show here. People can always reference it. And it, mm -hmm. this is a good record for the, for the, at least if anything else, let's say you've completely blown it. We're crazy. Got a compelling case. You've got things that absolutely have to put, make people go, I would hate for that to, me to be in that position. Mm -hmm. And that's that kind of critique needs to go against the justice system because if someone is this guilty, do it right, be above board, put the person in jail for the rest of their lives. But we have this many holes. Thankfully, someone is here to point this out because if you didn't do this, yeah, nobody would have. Nobody would have. Right? <laughs> we we would. No one would know the truth. And you know, to me, one of the, the, the just to finish up here, and I, and I appreciate all the time you guys have given this, but to me, the larger issues are also the media how the media is out of control. They're not to be trusted. It's all agenda driven, narrative driven. And, and also with regard, one of the things I've learned about the, the, the issue of child sex abuse, I think the pendulum has, has gone too far now in the other direction for many, many years. Obviously we were death to this issue and we were uh, unwilling to believe that anyone would do this. And because of that, I think there has been an overreaction. And now I think, now you get accused of something like this and it is almost impossible to defend yourself. And there has to be a moderation in that. Uh, now this case is unusual for a number of reasons, mostly because of Joe Paterno, but we've seen it Duke lacrosse UVA. Yeah. I mean, when people get hear that R word rape, they, their brains explode. And uh, I, I'm a little concerned we've gone too far in the other direction. You know, when I, I've spoken to many uh, victims of child sex abuse, including a, a guy, I spoke to a guy who had a very similar, a story that sounds very similar to Sandusky. In, a, in the 60s and the 70s, it was a co football coach of his who sexually abused him. He wrote a book about it. And I spoke to him, and it was interesting because one of the things he said was, you know, when I finally came forward, the wind was in my face. Mm. You know, no one wanted to believe me. And that really struck with me because I'm like, all right, I get that. And that sucks. But these guys in, in the 2000s, they had a hurricane wind at, the, at their back. At their back. Yeah. And it's a totally different deal. We've taken that wind and we've turned it from in their face to now, if it's in, especially if it's in a situation where the media wants to tell the story, now it's not just a little wind. It's a hurricane force at their back. And it's and incentivized with money. Yeah. And, and, and that didn't happen in the sixties or seventies. Right. And by the way, I know we're going to get off on another beaten path here, but I, I know we need to finish this up, but, but <laughs> folks just use your common sense in the two thousands. I've been a coach in, in football, basketball, golf, these guys, for these kids for the, for good have been educated about what yeah. people are not supposed to do. You can't raise your voice for better, or for worse to a kid without a complaint coming against a parent or by a parent or by a kid or somebody. Oh, you abused my kid. The idea that these guys, Aaron Fisher didn't know it was wrong for Jerry Sandusky to stick his dick in his mouth a hundred times at the age of 13 and 14. Come on, come on. It's absurd. And it's, and it's absurd because it didn't happen. And Aaron Fisher said many times it didn't happen. It was only after everything was clear he was going to get money that that's the story he told. He always told his friends that he wanted sports cars. That was his, he wanted, to, he wanted money and sports cars. And guess what's happened? I'll tell you what, uh, all of these guys, they all have sports cars. It's amazing. They all have sports cars and they're all gamblers. This whole thing has been the, the greatest economic boom for the sports car industry in the state college area you could ever imagine because they all got sports cars. 
Uh, and I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of them are gambling. I'm not just talking about a little bit of gambling, like professional gamblers. I think it's in something in their mentality. Either they've got guilt or what they've done and they're gambling it, or it was that gambler mentality at the beginning that said, you know what? Fuck, let's let it ride. I smell a big payday. Yeah, let's see what roll happens. Dice. Yeah, let's roll the dice. Hmm. So anyway, I really appreciate you guys being open-minded because this is the greatest record that we have uh, to date on this case, and I, I'm really glad that it exists, and I really appreciate you guys being more open-minded than anyone else uh, about what the real truth is. So you guys deserve a lot of credit, and I, I really appreciate it. I said it once before, and I'll close by calling you what we think you are. Our guest on the Break It Down show, thank you very much. Soldier for Justice, John Ziegler. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you.